do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against, against the dying, dying of the light. Of the light. That means two things in this movie. One, obviously, is to fight against death and extinction as a species. But the other is a metaphor for Gargantua, the film's gigantic black hole. I'll prove it to you. Hey everyone, my name's Tom Kugler, and in this video I'll be breaking down some of Interstellar's biggest visual motifs and themes. And we will be getting into spoilers here, so you have been warned. About midway through Interstellar, Romley mentions that Gargantua is a gentle singularity. Talk to me. Gargantua is an older spinning black hole. It's what we call that, a gentle singularity. Gentle. Hmm. Upon a quick Google search, I found that gentle singularity isn't even a term that exists among astrophysicists. So why would Romley use that word specifically? It's because gentle represents the gentle from the poem. Do not go gentle into that good night. To me, it's clear the filmmakers put this there for a reason. For a film that is so specific about all of the scientific details, right? Why would they put in gentle singularity as a term, acting like it's actually for real? So do not go gentle into that good night. Good night, as in the black hole. It makes even more sense with the second phrase. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. They say many times in this movie that not even light can escape a black hole. Nothing escapes that horizon. Not even light. Light literally goes there to die. So Dr. Brand's favorite poem is both a battle cry for the human race, and it's also really bad advice. We all know the very thing that Cooper has to do is enter the black hole and go into the gentle singularity that is Gargantua to solve the gravity equation and save the human race. Dr. Mann, which is a very interesting name, by the way, says that Our survival instinct is our single greatest source of inspiration. But that's kind of wrong, isn't it? You know, for Cooper, his greatest source of inspiration is getting back to his family, his love that he has for his daughter and his son. Miss Brand falls into this camp as well. About halfway through the movie, she talks about how the love she has for Edmonds is pulling her to go see him again. I'm drawn across the universe to someone I haven't seen in a decade, who I know is probably dead. Kind of like gravity. So we have two camps. We have lovers versus realists. Believers in love, this ethereal force that you can't explain with sheer science. The lovers of this movie are Murph, Cooper, and Dr. Brand, or Miss Brand. The realists of the movie are Tom, Dr. Brand, and Dr. Man. They represent two different ideologies. The realists are more robotic and focus on what needs to be done, and the dreamers are more focused on intuition and love. You could say the realists are more pessimistic about human nature. He knew how hard it would be to get people to work together to save the species instead of themselves. And the lovers are more optimistic about human nature. They made it a point that the crew of the Endurance needed to have little to no emotional ties to anybody on Earth or anybody in general. You know, they've had families, huh? No, no attachments. My father insisted. And what does that imply? It implies that even if they had emotional ties and, and people that they love, that they wouldn't be able to fulfill the mission because they'd be too focused on getting back to the people that they love on Earth. They needed to not let their humanity get in the way of their goal. But it's funny because the humanity of the Endurance team is actually what helps them accomplish the mission in the first place. Doyle, instead of saving his own skin on Miller's planet, orders TARS to go and save Miss Brand instead. Cooper sacrifices himself by going into the black hole, which then saves all of humanity. And Romney waits for the crew for decades to get back. And why? Is it because they put the needs of the mission above themselves? No, I'm gonna argue that this crew loved each other and they did all of this for love. And that is the reason why they succeeded in the end. Love is the reason why Cooper and Murphy solve the gravity equation in the first place. Murph ends up finding the answer because she trusts her intuition and she trusts that her father loves her. 
and wouldn't abandon her on planet Earth. Love was the missing ingredient to solving the gravity equation. Let's talk about gravity for a second, because gravity in and of itself is a huge motif and theme throughout the whole entire movie. Whether it's baseball, a game that literally needs gravity in order to be played, tidal waves, which are you know known to be caused by gravity, the spinning of the ship, which creates artificial gravity, and dust, right? A rather interesting way to show gravity happening in real time. And then you have Gargantua, which is the biggest object in the film, and it has the biggest gravitational pull of anything in the movie. So what does it mean, right? Gravity is a force that attracts two objects together, kind of like love. Love is the one thing that can transcend time and space. Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Guess what else can transcend time and space? Gravity. You have worked out that you can exert a force across space-time. Gravity. To send a message. Affirmative. During the mission, Cooper feels this pull to go back to his family. He eventually sees Murph again because love pulled him back to her. Murph mentions that she has a ghost at home and she's convinced that it exists, despite her brother and her father teasing her about it all the time. Like gravity and love, ghosts are invisible. There's a lot of talk about natural versus unnatural in this movie. Popcorn at a ball game is unnatural. I want a hot dog. And ghosts are supernatural beings, right? Believing in them doesn't really make much scientific sense, but also love doesn't make much scientific sense either. I can't help but think that this film has something to say about religion, too. Besides Dr. Man having 11 followers, kind of like Jesus. 12 possible worlds, 12 ranger launches. Carrying the bravest humans ever to live, led by the remarkable Dr. Man. He also talks about how the laws of nature prohibit a naked singularity. Naked, like Adam and Eve in the garden. The best evidence we have for religious overtones, though, is the infamous handshake between Cooper and Miss Brand. The first time we see it, it looks like a ghost in the ship. The second time we see it, Cooper is bathed in light, and it strikes me significantly like the painting of Adam and God in the Sistine Chapel. Layer on top of that the heavy use of organs in the movie, and yes, you have tons of religious overtones in this movie, for sure. The fact that nature is not good or evil, right? And it's kind of like the tree of good and evil. I think there's some overtones here that we might have missed, right? And it makes the most sense to bring back the dreamers versus realists idea. Realists wouldn't believe in God because you can't explain it with science, right? But the dreamers would. They would believe in something like God. Obviously, shapes are also everywhere in this movie, whether it's the Tesseract at the very end of the film, or a Rubik's Cube on Murph's bedside table, the centrifuge. Well, this entire facility is a centrifuge. The spherical wormhole or the circular black hole, right? Shapes are everywhere. I wanna focus on the centrifuge for a second. Small centrifuges are used to separate liquids as they spin around really, really, really fast inside of a vial. Large centrifuges can be used to create artificial gravity. Circles and spinning is something that in general comes up time and time again in this movie. On Miller's planet, Cooper needs to fly in a spiral to shave off speed as they approach the surface. The wormhole is located near Saturn, a ringed planet. Cooper's watch is what ultimately gives Murph the answer to the gravity equation. And in perhaps the most dramatic part of the movie, Cooper needs to connect to the endurance while spinning at above 60 RPM. Time is obviously one of the more obvious themes in the movie, and it's talked about many times by many characters. And for me, the endurance is a visual representation of time raging on. Throughout the movie, the crew is battling against it, whether on the surface of Miller's planet or when Cooper nearly runs out of oxygen on man's. 
It's always their adversary, it seems, and it makes sense that in the, you know, the visceral finale of the movie, Cooper needs to connect back to the Endurance while experiencing heavy G-forces. And for me, it's just a representation of, of time raging on. I want to talk about a few more ideas here. The four elements seem to be everywhere in this movie. Water, earth, fire, and air. Miller's planet is literally all water, okay? Man's planet is frozen water. When the crew goes to sleep in their cryo beds, it's filled with, you guessed it, water. And the very crops they need to grow to survive need water. Murph represents fire. When Dr. Brand arrives at Cooper's home to bring back his truck, he says this about Murph. Murph is a bright spark. Maybe I should fan the flame. And in the famous poem that's quoted time and time again, they say, old age should burn and rage at close of day. They burn the crops to prevent blight from spreading to the rest of their harvest. And to solve the gravity equation, Murph needs to burn the, the crops of her brother Tom in order to buy herself time. In the black hole, do you remember what Cooper sees first? He sees dust and fire. He sees like little pellets of like sparks. Let's talk about Earth, okay? Dust is a beautiful representation of gravity because you can literally see it floating down to the floor. And in the black hole, for whatever reason, a cloud of dust is the very first thing that Cooper sees. I always found that really weird, and I'm not sure why he sees it, but he sees it. And then you have air, whether it's oxygen or the thrusters that the ship uses to maneuver around space and connect to the endurance. And then you have the air thrusters that direct the actual spacesuits that these people are using. But there's very much a fifth element at play here. I mean, we always hear about the four elements, but in ancient Greece, they also mentioned a fifth one called ether. Ether was thought of as the material that filled the universe above the terrestrial sphere. Sphere. In Greece, they thought that ether was literally the stuff that gods breathed. And it was used in many scientific theories to explain natural phenomena like gravity and the traveling of light. Today we think of ether as invisible, right? Like, I lost it in the ether, like a thought that you might have lost, it's now in the ether. For a movie that talks a lot about invisible forces like gravity and love, I think ether fits right in here perfectly. So what does it mean? Well, they're the four elements of nature. Nature, nature is neither good or evil, it just is. It doesn't matter whether huge tidal waves manifested on Miller's planet or whether huge storms of dust manifested on Earth. Water also helps the crops grow on Earth. Fire also helps the ships move across space-time. These elements can either help or not help, but they're not evil, just like nature. They're not evil. You know, it's binary, right? Another really common theme in the movie. There's a plan A and a plan B. It's not Morse, Murph, it's binary. Murphy's Law was originally looked at as a bad thing in this film, but maybe it's not all bad. Maybe it's just relative, like Einstein's theories. Well, Murphy's Law doesn't mean that something bad will happen. What it means is that whatever can happen will happen, and that's happening just fine with us. Earlier in the movie, Murph, Tom, and Cooper get a flat tire while moving into town. Tom blames it on Murphy's Law, obviously, and they hop out of the truck to try to go fix it. And just as they hop out, a drone flies overhead. And then they get back into the truck and go chase it. Sure, maybe it was originally a bad thing that the tire blew, but if it never blew, then they would have gone into town and he would have gone to, to his daughter's school and he would have been sitting in a meeting perhaps at the same time the drone flew over their crops. If they never stopped, then they would never have the battery from that drone. So perhaps it wasn't a bad thing that the tire blew after all. Interstellar is chock full of meaning and messages and stunning visuals. And when I saw it nine years ago, I didn't think I quite understood what it was trying to say. But when I rewatched it a couple times just recently, I couldn't help but write down all these little things that I was seeing. And, and this is just my interpretation, honestly. I mean, I'm, I might be wrong about all this stuff. I wanna see what you think about this as well. So if you want, please comment down below this video what you thought of some of the things that I pointed out 
whether I missed anything, whether you thought differently about something that I saw. And I would also love to know if you would like to see me review any other movies in this detailed analysis type of way. At the end of the movie, Cooper finds himself back where he started on his own front porch wondering about the future of the human race. In the final moments, he feels a tug to go see Miss Brand again. And if he's learned anything lately, it's that following his intuition is the right course of action. So he begins another mission for the same reason he left Earth originally in the Endurance over 80 years ago, for love.